Welcome to Frontiers in Oncology. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. And we're very pleased um, at this uh, installment of Frontiers in Oncology to be co-hosting the seventh annual Carl Bluma Memorial Lecture. Uh, in way of brief introduction, Carl was um, a giant at Stanford who led the bone marrow transplant division for many years and played an instrumental role in the founding of the Stanford Cancer Institute. Um, I would now like to introduce Dr. Rob Negrin, who will provide further introductions for our esteemed speaker this morning. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for hosting us at this very important uh, lecture for our, for our team. And welcome to the seventh annual Carl G. Bloom Memorial Lecture. I have the honor of saying a few words about Carl and introducing our speaker, Kate Tierney. As a child, Carl grew up amongst the challenges of post-World War II Germany, where he was educated at the top institutions in Germany with a particular affinity at the University of Freiburg, which he returned to many, many times over the years. He came to the United States initially to study red blood cell biochemistry under the tutelage of the late Dr. Ernie Beutler. He was soon recruited to the City of Hope National Medical Center and established the City of Hope as a premier center for hematology and bone marrow transplantation in the very, very early years of the field. This program continues to be one of the, the, the truly strong programs in the world. In 1987, Carl was recruited to Stanford by Saul Rosenberg, Ron Levy, Irv Weissman, and many others to form a bone marrow transplant program here at Stanford. When Carl arrived, he knew that in order to have an outstanding transplant program, he needed to de develop a team-based care model. And he also knew that engaging and having excellent nursing staff were key ingredients. Engaging the nursing and support staff, though, although a common practice today, was not the case when Carl arrived in 1987. Carl's search for nursing and social work leadership, where he found key individuals such as Angela Johns, Trilla Barr, and our speaker, Kate Tierney. Looking back, his wisdom was never been clearer, as a team-based model of care is a central pillar of excellence that we embrace each and every day. I first met Kate when we bonded over a patient on our unit and found our mutual admiration for life in Madison, Wisconsin, where Kate received her BS in nursing. Kate went on to be a staff nurse at the University of Washington in Seattle, where she worked in the bone marrow transplant unit under the likes of E. Donald Thomas and others and as you recall, Dr. Thomas won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1990. Kate then went on to, to, to the Naval Hospital at the University of Pennsylvania as a nurse corps officer, where she received her master's in nursing. Lucky for all of us, Kate came to Stanford in 1989 as an oncology nurse specialist with our program, where she has remained for the last 31 years. Interestingly and, uh, and importantly, Kate went on to receive her PhD at UCSF and joined the faculty at Stanford as an assistant clinical professor in the Division of Primary Care and Population Health. Kate has earned too many honors to recount, but I'm sure those closest to her heart include the ONS Foundation Leadership Award and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Society of Blood and Marrow Transplantation. She has been a major voice in our field lectured widely and also published widely. When I took over as division chief in 2000, I turned to Kate for advice, which I've done many times over the last 20 years. When I have a problem I have no idea how to solve, I routinely turn to Kate who will state something like, I will look into it, roughly translated as it's solved. No one commands more respect, has more humility, more intimate knowledge and experience, and use it as effectively as Kate Tierney. When Carl passed away in 2013, survived by his wife Vera, who I understand is joining us, their two children, six grandchildren, those of us who greatly benefited from Carl's leadership and mentorship established this lecture in his honor. No one is more deserving of the honor to address us in the context of this lectureship than Dr. Kate Tierney. Kate, thank you so much for accepting our uh, invitation. The title of her talk is After the Cure, other important outcomes following blood and marrow transplantation. Okay. And if I can make one, one uh, note, um, thank you, Rob, uh, for all the participants. 
The way we're doing questions and answers is to please enter them on your Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And then there's an upvoting feature so you can upvote the questions from other participants. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to thank the leadership of the Stanford Cancer Institute, in particular, Laura Adams, for inviting me to be part of this series, Frontiers in Oncology, and for sponsoring the seventh Dr. Carl G. Bluma Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Rob, for that very kind introduction. So my topic this morning is after the cure, other important outcomes following blood and marrow transplantation. So it is truly an honor to have been asked to give this lecture in Carl's memory, as it was my great fortune to call Carl both a mentor and a friend. And I am humbled by the stature of the speakers who have gone before me who are world renowned experts and each has made significant scientific contributions to our field and doubly blessed to call Dr. Negrin a mentor and a friend. So in my mind's eye, standing before you is a 12 year old girl who decided in the sixth grade after a very basic anatomy and physiology class to become a nurse. And I announced to my family that I wanted to be a nurse because the body was fascinating and I could help people. Now my sister does take some credit for planting that seed earlier when for Christmas one year, she gave me a little black satchel with a nursing cap and a cape and a syringe and a stethoscope. But nevertheless, in the mirror this morning, I did not see a 12 year old girl, but a gray haired woman who has spent nearly her entire 40 year career caring for blood and marrow transplant recipients. And I wish I could tell you that I had the foresight at the beginning of my career to know that if I stayed in the field for a long time, I would witness change. But it is only in hindsight that I can appreciate the significant advances that have occurred in this field over the past four decades. So I would be amiss as a nurse if I didn't mention Florence Nightingale, as 2020 is the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife, as we celebrate the bicentennial of her birth. Ms. Nightingale was born in Florence, Italy, hence her name, to a wealthy aristocratic British family. And the norms in the Victorian era were that women became wives and mothers. But she rejected those roles and with the support of her father received an education. And she became a social reformer, a statistician, and the founder of modern nursing. Many of you know this history. She began her career in November of 1854 when she arrived with 38 nurses or as Dr. Bloomer would call them sisters, in Scutari to care for soldiers of the Crimean War. And the conditions they encountered were deplorable and men were dying of infectious diseases and not their wounds. And she instituted improved sanitation, ventilation, cleanliness, warmth, improved nutrition, fresh air and light, and is credited with reducing mortality from 42 to 2%. In 1860, she established the first secular school of nursing at St. Thomas Hospital, which is now part of King's College in London. And this is a photo of the first graduating class in 1866. And in 1859, she wrote notes on nursing, which established the principles of nursing care that are still relevant today. Now, one could ask, what do Florence Nightingale and Dr. Bluma have in common? And I would argue that they were both influential, effective, and respected leaders who have left an enduring legacy. When I interviewed for my position with Dr. Bloom, I assumed as a physician he would quiz me on my clinical acumen, but he did not. He spent his time describing the vision he had for the program and the team he needed to make that vision a reality. And of course, his vision was to put the Stanford Blood and Marrow Transplant Program at the forefront of basic and translational research to make significant contributions scientifically and clinically to the field and provide exceptional patient care. And he needed a team comprised of individuals with intelligence, creativity, dedication, who each brought unique strengths to the team, but also complementary strengths. Dr. Bloom was not afraid to make decisions, even unpopular decisions. He had very high expectations and he challenged us often. With each challenge, he was there every step of the way to make sure that we succeeded in reaching that challenge. And he inspired tremendous loyalty. 
it was very hard to say Dr. no to Dr. Bluma. And because he had such faith in you, you didn't want to disappoint him. So the use of marrow to treat disease goes back a ways. In the late 1930s, physicians prescribed fresh bone marrow from young cattle mixed with orange juice to treat anemia. And the prescription was for one teaspoonful three times a day. And I am certain if there is an argument for a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down, bone marrow mixed with orange juice would be one of those instances. But fast forward a couple decades, and Dr. E. Donald Thomas begins infusing marrow extracted from healthy donors into identical twin siblings who had leukemia. And there was early evidence of engraftment, but patients unfortunately quickly relapsed. <clears throat> So fast forward another couple decades, and he and his team published a Sentinel paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1975. And in that paper, they described their experience treating 70 individuals with advanced leukemia, of which nine became survivors of a year or more, and 37 individuals with severe plastic anemia, of which 16 became long-term survivors. And while those are not the best odds, that experience established the foundation of our field. So now we fast forward four decades and you can see the growth in transplantation. So in the United States in 2018, approximately 9,000 allogeneic transplants were performed and about 14,000 autologous transplants. And the graph on the right shows data from the worldwide network of blood and marrow transplantation, summarizing growth in transplants from 2006 to 2012. And you can see the growth continues to climb. And in 2012, in fact, we transplanted the one millionth individual. According to the World Health Organization, uh, we are performing approximately 50,000 transplants worldwide each year, and that number is increasing. So the Stanford VMT program recently celebrated its 30th anniversary. And you, um, as of June 2020, we have transplanted over 7,400 individuals, of which approximately half have become long-term survivors. And you can see in this photo of patients, uh, these are individuals who are now more than 25 years post-transplant, including numero uno, as he likes to call himself, who was the first adult transplant recipient. And it is estimated that by 2030, the number of survivors will exceed 500,000. So after the cure, late effects. So we know across this numerous series that the about 35 to 40% of autologous recipients and 60 to 80% of allogeneic transplant recipients will report one or more physical or psychological late effects. And this can include organ toxicity and acceleration of chronic diseases. And these late effects are cumulative and multifactorial. And they include, and due to underlying disease, comorbidities, lifestyle factors, genetic susceptibilities, the therapy received antecedent to transplant, the conditioning regimen used in transplant, as well as the prevention and, and treatment of complications of transplant. And we know subsequent malignancies is a bitter pill across oncology, with allogeneic survivors who are 10 or more years post-transplant have a 5 to 12 percent risk of death due to subsequent malignancies, and autologous transplant recipients who are 10 or more years plus have a 3 to 6% risk of death due to sub subsequent malignancies. And chronic graft-versus-host disease remains a major cause of morbidity and mortality, as well as exerting a negative impact on quality of life. So while these are all very important late uh, outcomes following transplant, I want to turn my attention to health-related quality of life, recovery challenges, and a few notes about our caregivers. So Dr. Bluma early on studied quality of life following transplant, and he designed a very short 10 item questionnaire to be administered every three months over the telephone by a clinical nurse specialist. And this is a publication from our group a long time ago, looking at 58 autologous recipients at 90 days and one year. And you can see across each dimension, there's improvement from 90 days to one year. And by one year, approximately 80% are employed, 53% report a stable weight, nearly 90% report a good appetite, 
three quarters are sleeping well, two thirds report a satisfying sex life, one third experience frequent colds, almost 100% are satisfied with their appearance, and less than half are taking medications on a regular basis. And the last question on this uh, tool was to rate your quality of life on a scale of one to 10, with one being poor and 10 excellent. So I'd actually like to pause for a moment and ask you to rate your quality of life on this scale of one to 10. So if you participated in that exercise, each of you thought probably about different dimensions of your life. Some of you may have actually considered your physical health, your professional life, your emotional health, your relationships, existential concerns, finances. But I'm hoping that you compared favorably with our autologous transplant recipients who at uh, one year rate their quality of life at 8.9 on a scale of one to 10. So health-related quality of life research has evolved since that study by Dr. Bluma. We certainly know that health-related quality of life is an important outcome measure across oncology. The instruments have become more sophisticated with extensive development, testing, factor analysis, validity and reliability assessments, as have the statistical analysis become more sophisticated. And for many years, the research focused on the study of health-related quality of life. But in the past decade, it has been rewarding to see that we're actually conducting intervention studies to improve health-related quality of life. And I think some of this has paralleled the development of survivorship clinics across oncology. And another important trend is the inclusion of survivors and caregivers and their perspectives. So there have been two important national initiatives. I was pleased to participate in both. The first was the National Institutes of Health from 2014 to 2016, convened uh, working groups uh, comprised of transplant experts, patient advocates, survivors, and caregivers to establish research priorities and establish best practices to improve survivor health. And they identified the following as important research priorities, patient-centered outcomes, immune dysregulation and pathobiology, particularly as it relates to chronic graft-resistant host disease and immune reconstitution, cardiovascular disease and risk factors, subsequent neoplasms, healthcare delivery, research methodology, and study design. And the second initiative was conducted by the National Marrow Donor Program, which also convened a panel of experts, survivors, caregivers, and advocates. And they came up with a fairly similar list, patient and caregiver education and support, emotional, cognitive, and social health, physical health and fatigue, sexual health and relationships, financial burden, and models of survivorship care delivery. And healthcare delivery is a recurring theme and important because after the acute phase of transplant, our recipients return to their home communities and at that point, they no longer have immediate access to the transplant specialist. And their care is probably being overseen by multiple providers, their primary care provider, their hematologist or oncologist. If there are comorbidities, there's a medical specialist involved. So there's a real risk that their care will become quite fragmented. And it's been difficult to conduct uh, research on late effects because transplant survivors typically are not interested in returning to the transplant center on a frequent basis for study assessments. So perhaps our use of telemedicine um, with, during this COVID-19 pandemic will open some doors to conduct uh, research on late effects in the home community. Survivorship clinics, uh, regardless of the model of care they use to deliver survivorship care, um, have an important goal to minimize morbidity and mortality and maximize health and health-related quality of life. And we know that cancer survivors have a host of complex physical and psychological concerns, and that cancer survivorship is a mixture of both hope and uncertainty. So follow-up care is essential not only to assess for evidence of disease, but for health maintenance recommendations and strategies to improve adherence to health maintenance recommendations. 
survivorship clinics are also important to, to help us detect problems early and intervene to minimize late effects. And care plans have become a, an important tool in facilitating communication and care across multiple healthcare systems and providers. So we know that the majority of transplant survivors report good to excellent health-related quality of life, and that in general, health-related quality of life improves with time. By five years, approximately 63% of survivors have returned to pre-transplant physical and psychological functioning. By three years, almost 80% are employed full-time. And despite the very intense physical and psychosocial demands of transplant, most experience good psychological health. We know across series that approximately 35 to 43 percent report emotional distress and the incidence of clinical depression is reported in the range of 10 to 15 percent. So this graph shows trajectories of psychological health following a cancer diagnosis. So you can see that the individuals moving along with their baseline level of psychological health, they get a cancer diagnosis and their psychological health likely deteriorates. And how much it deteriorates is dependent on a number of interpersonal, intrapersonal, and social variables. And they may continue to deteriorate following their cancer diagnosis. They may deteriorate to a certain level and then recover some, but they never return to their baseline level of psychological health, so they are left with impairments. Or they may recover to their baseline, and in some individuals there's actually post-traumatic growth. So recovering from a transplant is certainly physically demanding, but there are also numerous psychological concerns. Fear of recurrence is almost universal, and it's a fear held not only by the survivor, but the survivor's loved ones. There's tremendous uncertainty about the future for not only themselves, but their families. There's disruption to life plans, be that related to education, marriage, children, careers, or retirement. In addition to survivors, guilt. Many transplant survivors also carry guilt about the burdens and stress they placed on their family. There can be a sense of diminished self-worth and wondering if they will ever return to normal. There are social and community reintegration concerns. They need to return to their former valued roles, be that a parent, spouse, partner, community, or professional. Resumption of social relationships. Relationship and marital distress related to lengthy hospitalizations, treatments, role shifting of responsibilities during treatment, employment and insurance discrimination, and financial insecurity. We know that about 56% of individuals report a decline in financial security, and about 15% report difficulties paying bills on a monthly basis and uh, having money left over at the end of the month. We also did some work with Dr. Karen Cook in the Department of Sociology here at Stanford, looking at um, individuals when they try to re-enter their education or their careers and feeling like they are left behind or they never quite catch up with their peers. So they took a year out or more to deal with their health issues and when they re-enter their educational situation or their work, they feel like they're constantly trying to catch up with their peers. And there can also be spiritual or existential concerns, such as a loss of hope, a lost sense of meaning or purpose in life. So recovery, needless to say, is challenging physically and emotionally. And Dr. Margaret Bevins, a neuroscientist at the National Institutes of Health, has identified a number of tasks that need to be completed in order for a successful recovery. And I go through this list, I would ask you to think about some of the patients in your clinics who might be struggling with these tasks. So they need to reestablish their primary identity. They need to leave behind the role of patient. They need to re-engage in valued personal, professional, and community roles, and acknowledge and accept any potential or actual long-term effects of transplantation. So this was a nice study targeted individuals who were experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder or distress symptoms after transplant. So in this intervention trial, they screened 408 individuals for distress, of which 81 uh, met the criteria for distress and were enrolled in the study. 
And these 81 individuals were randomized to a control arm, which included simply assessment or the intervention arm. And the intervention was telephone administered cognitive behavioral therapy. And this was conducted by a postdoctoral fellow in psychology who had training in cognitive behavioral therapy. And so there were 10 telephone sessions administered over approximately four months. The initial assessment took about an hour and a half and each subsequent assessment took about an hour. And at the conclusion of the study, they found a significant decrease in post-transplant, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as you can see in the blue line, a decrease in global distress compared to the control group, as well as a significant decline in depression. And these effects were maintained over a 12 month period of time. So this was a successful trial and it uh, targeted those individuals who were experiencing distress it was administered in their home communities. But this was also a very extensive tri expensive trial and required uh, uh, healthcare professionals trained in cognitive behavioral therapy to administer. So not necessarily a very scalable intervention. A more recent study looked at using a web-based program to intervene in individuals that were experiencing distress or physical dysfunction and fatigue. So they enrolled 755 individuals who were uh, less than 10 years post-transplant. In the control group, group zero, there were 411 participants. And this group had no evidence of distress, emotional distress, or physical dysfunction or fatigue. And so they became the control group and they were given access to the web-based program at the conclusion of the study. And group one included 344 individuals who scored positive on distress on the outcome measures you can see on the right. And so about 36% reported distress, 40% reported depression, and about 31% reported fatigue and physical dysfunction. And the interventions include, in, included INSPIRE, which is a web-based program that actually took several years of development and testing. And there are five main topics on the web-based program, boosting health, restoring energy, renewing outlook, getting connected, and tips and tools. There was a tailored homepage, healthcare guidelines, and a resource section. And the problem-solving therapy was conducted um, over the telephone by psychologists, licensed psychologists, and the goal was to focus on problems and goal setting. And in the first session, they developed the problem list and then in each subsequent 30 minute session, identified one problem to address. And participants had about three to seven sessions, about two weeks apart. So you can see in this table, the relative risks comparing rates of improvement across the three study arms. And the compared to controls, participants randomized to the INSPIRE plus the problem solving therapy had significant improvements in distress but there was no difference in physical functioning, depressive symptoms, or fatigue. And again, I think this is an important study because it enrolled a large number of participants, 755. So web-based technologies may be very acceptable to survivors. And it was also administered in their home communities. And when they did a secondary analysis, they found that individuals who accessed the website more frequently, viewed more pages, were over the age of 40 and were female had more benefits from the program than other individuals in the study. So this study group is now looking at ways to enhance the web-based program to appeal to a broader number of survivors and ways to engage survivors to use the web-based program on a more frequent basis. So another strategy <clears throat> is to develop a risk predictive model to identify the, those transplant recipients who are at risk for poor physical functioning or poor psychological health. And this study enrolled 489 individuals for a mean of six years post-transplant and 70% underwent allogeneic transplant. And the items in red show that these variables impacted both physical functioning and psychological health and included younger age, higher body mass index, autologous transplantation, and extensive chronic graft versus host disease. And additional factors that impacted poor physical functioning included part-time or no work, three or more comorbid conditions, and those additional variables that impacted poor psychological health 
included female gender and not living with a partner. So now I'd like to turn to alterations in sexual health or sexual dysfunction, which is another important health-related quality of life outcome. We know that the incidence of long-term sexual dysfunction is high and long-lasting, and that about 60% of women and 40% of men report problems. And in most studies, women do report more problems than men. These studies all have limitations. They are primarily cross-sectional studies, and they were conducted in individuals of Caucasian background who are married and heterosexual. So we have little to no information about individuals of the LGBTQ community. Some of the problems, sexual function, I mean problems that have been identified include hypoactive sexual desire disorder, vaginal dryness, painful sexual intercourse, arousal disorder, and erectile and ejaculatory dysfunction. And it's important to keep in mind that altered sexuality affects not only the quality of life of the survivor, but his or her sexual partner or partners. So the very first intervention is to address sexual health pre-transplant, and it needs to be part of the informed consent discussion. And we are very good at informing our recipients of the potential risks for infertility and premature ovarian failure. But I think it's also important to let them know that their interest in sexual activity will likely be low for six months or so. And if they do experience problems with sexual functioning, there are effective interventions. And we need to be proactive in providing this information because we know that patients typically will not ask about sexual activity and healthcare providers are equally reluctant to address the subject. And there are several studies that show that a discussion with a healthcare provider is associated with a significant decrease in sexual dysfunctions. And I believe it's important to include the sexual partner in this discussion because you can then address the partner's concerns, you can facilitate the partner's support of the transplant recipient, and perhaps open up communication within the couple around issues related to sexual health. And in that three to four minute conversation, you have accomplished a great deal. You've identified yourself as a resource. You have validated that sexuality is a legitimate area of concern. And you have helped facilitate adaptation by setting expectations that match reality. And you've reassured them if they experience problems, there are interventions. So I was really pleased to see this study published a couple of years ago. This is a pilot study of a multimodality intervention to enhance sexual functioning in survivors of transplant. So this was conducted in Massachusetts, Massachusetts General Hospital, and they screened 151 survivors for sexual dysfunction using the NCCN survivorship guidelines. And that includes two questions. Do you have problems with sexual functioning? And are these problems causing you distress? And 47 individuals screened positive after those two questions. So in this study, the study interventionists included a female physician and female next practice provider. They spent time reviewing the existing literature for assessing and treating sexual dysfunctions. They participated in a two hour training session with the director of the sexual health clinic. And they attended two days in the sexual health clinic to gain clinical experience. So these are the topics that were covered for male participants, erectile dysfunction, libido, arousal, intimacy, ejaculatory dysfunction, psychological concerns, body image, and graft versus host disease. And the therapies for men included phosphodiesterase enzyme inhibitors on demand, psychoeducation, which were education targeted at at those um, psychological and social variables that impact sexual functioning, such as anxiety, depression, fatigue, uh, communication, and body image. The third uh, strategy for men was penile constructive rings. Uh, referral to a sex sexual health clinic occurred in 9%, uh, and topical treatment of penile graft versus host disease. And the topics covered for female participants included pain, low libido, genital graft versus host disease, psychological issues, intimacy, arousal, and body image. And the three most common interventions were vaginal estrogen, dilator therapy, and lubricants, and as in men, psychoeducation targeting the psychosocial variables that impact sexual functioning. 
So you can see across all outcome measures, there were statistically significant improvements in satisfaction with sex, interest, orgasm, erectile function, vaginal lubrication and discomfort, and all quality of life measures improved. And the proportion of subjects not having sexual activity pre-intervention was approximately 33%, and post-intervention dropped to less than 7%. And again, this program, I think, was acceptable to participants. It was delivered by transplant providers with a small investment of both time and education. The first assessment was done in the clinic, but subsequent interventions were carried out over the telephone. So again, reach survivors in their home community. And I think it's feasible to adopt into EMT survivorship clinics. And now I'd like to turn just for a minute to caregivers. The number of caregivers of cancer patients in the United States is estimated to be 3 million. And we know that caregiving requires significant amounts of time and energy. And the performance of tasks related to caregiving are physically, emotionally, socially, and financially demanding. And the responsibilities include assistance with activities of daily living, medication management, meal preparation, finances, transportation, advocacy, physical and emotional support. And for our transplant recipients, they have to come to the Stanford area for approximately three months. So the caregiver is likely also managing two households, perhaps childcare and working. And a number of studies indicate that one of the most difficult tasks for caregivers is providing ongoing emotional support for the transplant recipient. And while I think most of our caregivers are quite prepared for the first three months of caregiving, when the survivor's needs extend for weeks to months to years beyond that three months, the tasks of caregiving become quite difficult. So this was a nice study conducted in transplant recipients that were on average about seven years post-transplant included 177 partners and uh, their survivors and 133 controls. And they were assessed on multiple health-related quality of life, life variables, including sleep problems, sexual problems, alertness, fatigue, depression, social support, loneliness, marital satisfaction or relationship satisfaction, spiritual well-being, and post-traumatic growth. And you can see on a number of variables that the caregivers were experiencing more distress than the patient. They felt less support, had higher loneliness scores, they had less marital satisfaction, less spiritual well-being, and less opportunity for, for post-traumatic um, growth. So across oncology, we need to address our caregivers' needs, and we need to uh, routinely and comprehensively assess caregiver strain and burden. And we know there are a number of evidence-based interventions that can be effective in intervening for our caregivers. So we know psychoeducational interventions are shown to improve knowledge, decrease burden, improve self-efficacy, mood, well-being, and quality of life. And supportive care interventions, those aimed at providing emotional support or a safe place to express emotions, and learn problem solving techniques can also reduce psychological distress. And cognitive behavioral interventions have shown to have positive effects on self efficacy, mood, psychological health, and quality of life. So, to conclude, it's um, most transplant recipients report good to excellent health related quality of life. But we have opportunities to continue to improve the health and well-being of our survivors. Working to reduce the toxicity of treatment will reduce late effects. Dr. Shizuro's work of using monoclonal antibodies to prepare people for transplant rather than chemotherapy and radiation is one effort. We need to develop more effective strategies to prevent graft-versus-host disease and the work by Dr. Negrin and Dr. Meyer to Manipulate the graft to reduce the risk of graft versus host disease is another effort in that direction. We need to continue to develop and test intervention that meets survivors and caregiver needs in the home community. We need to develop and expand our survivorship clinics to improve health and health related quality of life and engage our survivors and caregivers as partners in these endeavors. 
So every year we have a patient reunion and we invite our former patients back to celebrate life and living and hair. And it's truly the best day of the year. You get enough hugs on the reunion day to last you the entire year. Um, sadly, we did not have the reunion this year because of the pandemic. So many of you in the audience today know that I'm retiring soon. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank those to whom I'm indebted. And that would be first and foremost, our patients and their families who have entrusted me with the, their care for the past four decades. I continue to marvel at their courage and resilience and thank them for teaching me and reminding me what is important about life. And I would also like to thank my nursing colleagues for the past four decades who have inspired me with their compassion, their commitment, their humor, and their intelligence. To my physician colleagues whose commitment to advancing and improving outcomes is inspirational. To Dr. Negrin, who has kept the Stanford BMT program at the forefront of advancing science um, through 20 years of steadfast leadership and to the entire team of amazing individuals who make up the Stanford Blood and Marrow Transplant Program, who excel and carry on Dr. Bluma's legacy. And I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Kate, for that incredibly inspiring seminar. Um, it's really apparent how bone marrow transplant has grown over the years, helped so many countless individuals, and and um, and also how those patients struggle also during that process. And, and thank you for teaching us about that. And, and thank you for an extraordinary career um, here at Stanford in the BMT division. Um, we have one question. Rob, did you want to make any comments before we turn to questions? Uh, no, other than, uh, thank you, Steve, other than to thank Kate for uh, that really inspiring lecture. She uh, covered so many interesting topics and also for um, her incredible contributions over such a long period of time. And uh, we will miss her greatly when she does retire. We, we, there's some debate actually will allow her to retire or not, but, <laughs> but thank you, Kate. <laughs> okay, well, we have um, a question from Gary Goldstein who asks, what should the return to work expectation be for patients post transplants? What is the average time until they can return? How many remain on permanent disability? Um, so thank you um, for your kind comments. Uh, I think uh, returning to work for autologous transplant recipients, typically I think most physicians will consider it at two to three months. Depends a little bit on the kind of work environment they're gonna return to. And uh, in terms of allogeneic, I think that's more highly variable based on whether they're um, still on immunosuppressive therapy for graft versus host disease prevention or treatment. And again, the kind of work environment they're returning to. And I think um, I've never seen a number uh, specifying the number that remain on permanent disability, but we know that by three years, 80% of, of allogeneic recipients are working full time. So I think the number could be extrapolated to maybe about 20%, although some of that 20% may have elected to retire. I see. Thank you. We have a question from an anonymous attendee who asks, how had BMT changed most during your career? I'm how sorry. has BMT changed the most? Am I cutting out? Yeah, how how bit, has I'm BMT sorry. changed the most? Yeah, how has BMT changed the most in your career? What, what are the biggest changes you've seen in, in the field? Oh, I think uh, improvements in HLA typing that have expanded the donor pool so that we can almost get a donor for anybody. Um, I think supportive care. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story. When I was at the bedside and we were giving high-dose chemotherapy, we didn't have antiemetics. And so we gave very high doses of sleeping medication and then gave the chemotherapy at night. And you just sort of hoped they didn't wake up nauseous because there was little that you could do. And now nurses have 10 to 15 different antiemetics and it's very, very effective in controlling such a distressing symptom. So 
supportive care has improved dramatically. Um, uh, treatment of infectious diseases. Uh, there was a time if you had a history or a suspicion of a fungal infection, you were excluded from transplant because we did not have good antifungal therapy. And now I suspect more than half of our patients come in with a suspected fungal infection and we think nothing of it because we have very effective antifungal therapies. So many, 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 many changes. Thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, how will your good work with quality of life continue after you retire? Oh, there will be somebody to step into this role and do just fine. And uh, I, I think the um, movement to intervention studies is really exciting because uh, we've moved beyond measuring quality of life to actually intervening to improve. And again, I think our partnership with our survivor clinics will be important in that endeavor. Thank you. Donna Healy asks, Kate, if you had to pick one major change to the BMT process impacting the outcome of our patients, what would you say it is? Ooh. I think uh, I think some moving some things to the outpatient setting has improved quality of life during the transplant experience. I think our ability to now use uh, reduced intensity or non-myeloblative conditioning has really opened the door to treating more patients. We know that the vast majority of hematologic malignancies are diagnosed after in the sixth decade of life. So now we can actually offer transplants to that group where in the early days, if you were over about 50, that was too old for an allogenic transplant. So again, I think there's such a long list of amazing uh, improvements in the field. Thank you. We have a question from Mindy Charlin who asks, what advice would you give to nurses coming into the field today? And she notes, P.S. I am really going to miss working with you. <laughs> Thank you, Mindy. Um, I think it's important when you, when you walk out the door each night that you think about um, what you accomplished that day. Uh, because it, simply relieving nausea or reducing pain or being there when somebody just really needed somebody to talk to at that moment in time is very powerful. So to remind yourself when you walk from here to the parking lot each night what you've accomplished that day um, because our work is richly rewarding. Very clearly so. Those are the ends of our questions. Rob, do you have some questions or comments you'd like to end with? No, I, maybe I could just ask uh, Kate, um, maybe if you could reflect um, on how you see um, the, the future of the healthcare team moving forward. Maybe you could reflect a little bit on how you've seen it change over the years and what, what, do you, what is your advice for next generation of nurses and physicians and all the other uh, individuals involved in, in the care of patients like ours? How do, how do we work even better as a team? I think one of the challenges we face um, is some of the lim limitations in healthcare delivery. And so um, you can remember our experiences in the program recently where we had a shortage of beds and the added stress that put on um, the professionals to try to deliver care with um, less than adequate resources. And so I think it's important to, um, when we institute changes to address those resources that we consider uh, not only the institutional's needs, but I think we have to be very careful about considering the caregiver's needs because a lot of changes that we've done um, move the burden from the healthcare team to the caregiver. And I think we have to be very careful about um, making sure we're assessing the impact of that on our caregivers because they are continually to assume a bigger role in healthcare. Um, and I think stay true to your core. Um, remind yourself regularly why you entered uh, to become a doctor or a nurse or a physical therapist or a dietitian and, and hold on to those cores, core values. We have one further question from Laura Johnston who says, a beautiful presentation, Kate, and I am honored to have learned how to care for our transplant patients under your guidance. Do you have suggestions how to incorporate the sexual health aspect of our patients' care? 
I think we're doing better at that. Um, if you read clinic notes, I think our team is doing a better job at asking our patients about whether they're having problems. And I think the next step is to establish a, a resource network or a referral network. We have a sexual health clinic uh, now at Stanford for females. We probably need to address that for males as well. So to build in where we can refer women or men who are having problems if we feel it's beyond our own expertise. Well, thank you very much, Kate, for an incredible seminar. And um, again, it's been our pleasure to, to co-host the Carl Bluma Memorial Lecture with you, Rob. Um, I think we now uh, just have announcements for the, the next Frontiers in Oncology is going to be Tuesday, September 1st. And that is going to be given by Tanya Gruber, who is our new Division Chief of Pediatric Hematology, Oncology, and Stem Cell Transplantation. And she's the director of the Bass Center for Cancer and Blood Disorder. So um, Tanya has just arrived this month to Stanford after an extensive search process. Um, and we're thrilled to have her with us. And we're looking forward to her, um, to her presentation on September 1. Uh, thank you all again. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Rob. And thank you to all our participants. It was an incredible turnout. And thank you all for your questions. And we're looking forward to your participation at the next Frontiers in Oncology.